Good morning. Good morning. The Lord be with you. We're glad you're here. Welcome to uh, the Presbyterian Church of Wilmington on Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to everyone. It's also Juneteenth, the celebration of African American freedom. And so this is an important day for our African American friends and it uh, hopefully will become an important holiday for all of us here in our nation as we celebrate the gift of freedom and uh, what that means for all of us. Uh, several announcements and then some prayer concerns. We uh, gave a total of $535 to the Pentecost offering, so thank you for that. And as you know, 40% of it will be used right here in Wilmington to help young, young people and children and young people. Uh, this Saturday, the trustees are having a cleanup day for the grounds. So that uh, starts at 9 o'clock Saturday morning. And uh, you're welcome to come and help with that uh, with some weed pooling, tree trimming, and so on and so forth. Uh, next Sunday, we'll have a special celebration of our good friend, Dr. Don Carlos Monteos to thank him for his beautiful stained glass window panels, which are here in the sanctuary and in the fellowship hall. So we will have a, a carry and dinner. I'm, I am promising pies from Lovely's Farm Market in Springboro. Maybe strawberry rhubarb if they have it. So anyway, sign up on the table right outside here as to what you will bring and we can celebrate Doc's wonderful artistry and how that's blessed our church. So those are the announcements, prayer concerns. Uh, Sandy Wiggett is doing pretty well. You know, not great, but not terribly. But she is uh, uh, now having hospice care to help support her at home. So keep her in your prayers. Uh, Anna Mae Rose now is, uh, was in the hospital, as you heard, and she's now back at Cape May in rehab. And uh, her daughter believes that she'll be cheered up by seeing some of her friends. So. Uh, please consider that an invitation perhaps to stop by for a short visit. Helen Middleton, last Sunday about 300 people gathered at the uh, Middleton barn to celebrate Tom Middleton's life. And then Helen had another fall this week and fractured the hip that she had surgery on last month. And so she had to have surgery on the same hip again. Uh, she's came through the surgery well, but she's in pain, so keep her in your prayers. Lori Gillette uh, went into the Ohio State Medical Center this week uh, because of falls and re issues related to Parkinson's, but Jim says she is supposed to be going to Cape May for rehab tomorrow, so keep Lori in your prayers. And then I just found out this morning that Avery Bennett uh, is in the hospital with COVID and apparently went in last night. So the family asks for prayers for him. Johnny Richardson was here last Sunday, but she's not here today because she's moving, moving to Florida. So we wish her well. And I wish if she were here, I'd ha have a prayer for her, but uh, pre please pray for her as she moves to Florida and we will miss her. Uh, but two notable anniversaries in our midst. Cliff and Pat Curtis, 65 years. <laughs> Congratulations. We also have with us Manfred and Diane from Delaware, Ohio, whose son, you know from when he was a student at Wilmington College, uh, their son and his wife were here a couple weeks ago, and Manfred and Diane are celebrating their 40th anniversary. Congratulations. <laughs> So, with all of that in mind, let's celebrate God's presence, let's rejoice and give thanks, let's give thanks for our fathers, let's give thanks for freedom for all people, including our African American friends, and let's please stand now for the call to worship. Come, weary one, for God is in this place. Come, restless one, for God is in this place. Come, hopeful one, for God is in this place. Come, curious one, 
for God is in this place, in this place, in every place, God is here. Let us worship God. Our opening hymn is number 281, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. say thank you, Liz. That interlude and tra transition took me to a higher level. Thank you for that. That was beautiful. We come before God just as we are, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, as the old hymn writer, the old hymn, Just As I Am, says. So here we are with an opportunity to name our conflicts, our doubts, and our sins before one another and before God. So let us confess our sins. Let us pray together. God of birth, God of joy, God of life, we come to you as a people hungry for good news. We've been so dead to miracles that we have missed the world's rebirth. We have preoccupied ourselves with small details and have overlooked the joy you offer us. We have been so concerned with making a living that we have missed the life you set among us. Forgive us, gracious God. Open our eyes and our hearts to receive your gift. Open our lips and our hands to share it with all people. In your Son's name, amen. Please pray silently. God not only listens to the cries on our lips, but also hears the groaning of our hearts. 
God restores us to wholeness and invites us to a new way of living. Rejoice that in Jesus Christ, we are welcomed, loved, and forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Please share the peace with those around you. Okay. How are you doing this morning? Good. Happy Father's Day. Okay, well, I was thinking about the need for quiet because we live in a really noisy world, don't we? Yes, that's true. What are some of the noises we hear all the time? Me. Loud noises. What? Me. You, are you loud? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, there are people falling off the plane in Afghanistan. Those screens are pretty loud. Yeah, that's right. How about loud in loud car engines? Oh, that is so Car engines loud. can be yes. uh, motorcycles. Yes. Motorcycles are loud. <laughs> Machinery is loud. Horses. Airplanes are loud, aren't they? Horses. Huh? Horses? Uh huh. She's she's into horses. She loves horses. You love horses, don't you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, horses are loud. Well, I brought the quiet book today. You might know this book, but you know that we, it's a, one of the important things is to find times of quiet. And we're not very good at that in our world, are no, we? That's a rare occasion. No, not very good. So I want to share this little children's book. Amelia, you come over here so you can see the pictures. You want to come over here closer? Okay. All right, sit right there. There are many kinds of quiet. First, one awake quiet. Jelly side down quiet. Don't scare the robin quiet. Others telling secrets quiet. Coloring in the lines quiet. Thinking of a good reason you were drawing on the wall quiet. Hide and seek quiet. Last one to get picked up from school quiet. Swimming underwater quiet. It gets quiet when you're under the water, right? Oh, yeah. No, oh, yeah. no it doesn't? Okay. Pretending you're invisible quiet. Lollipop quiet. First look at your new hairstyle quiet. Sleeping sister quiet. Right before you yell surprise quiet. Making a wish quiet. Top of the roller coaster quiet. Best friends don't need to talk, quiet. Surprise visit from Aunt Tilly, quiet. Do a iguana's bite, quiet. Before the concert starts, quiet. Trying not to hiccup, quiet. First snowfall, quiet. 
I do love that. After the snow falls, you go outside, so quiet. Yeah. Car ride at night, quiet. Too many bubbles, quiet. <laughs> Story time, quiet. Tucking in Teddy, quiet. Bedtime kiss, quiet. What flashlight, quiet. Sound asleep, quiet. Well, one of the reasons we need quiet is so we can listen to God. Because if we're always busy and we're always listening and there's all this noise around us, it's hard to hear God, isn't it? We have to get quiet both outside and inside to hear God. So I hope you'll do that in the coming week. So let's pray together. Please repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God help us to be quiet, help us to be quiet so, we can hear your voice. so we can hear your voice. Amen. Well, as you know, Sarah's away, so Miss Linda is our teacher today, and you're going to go with her for Sunday school. So thank you. Listen to the words of the psalmist from Psalm 42. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food, day and night, while people say to me continually, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I went with the throng and led them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of thanksgiving, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. My soul is cast down within me, Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mazar, deep calls to deep at the thunder of your cataracts. All your waves and your billows have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I walk about mournfully? Because the enemy oppresses me, as with a deadly wound in my body. My adversaries taunt me, while they say to me continually, Where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted, disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thank you, Liz. Beautiful. Our second lesson today is from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 18, the account of Elijah fleeing from Queen Jezebel. Hear the word of God. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with a sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so, <clears throat> so may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this to time tomorrow. Then he was afraid and got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. At that place, he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, go out and stand in the mountain before the Lord for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. There came, then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. Also you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of Abel-Meholah, as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall kill and whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. But I, yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Come to us now, O Lord, in your still small voice, and speak to us your truth found in Holy Scripture as read and proclaimed. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church in New York City is unique in that over a span of 110 years, the church was served by just four pastors, 
all of them outstanding preachers and Christian leaders. Henry Sloan Coffin from 1905 until 1926, George Arthur Buttrick from 1927 until 1955, David H. C. Reed from 1956 until 1989, and Fred R. Anderson from 1991 until his retirement in 2015. 110 years, four pastors, all of them great Christian leaders, nationally known, internationally known in the case of David H. C. Reed. And that's pretty remarkable when compared to how often most congregations change pastors. So I'd like to share a story from the last of those pastors, Fred Anderson. His predecessor, David Reed, was in the last week of his life. Pastor Anderson visited him at the hospital and was surprised to hear this noted Christian preacher say, after preaching and believing in the resurrection all of these years, suddenly I find myself being filled with questions and moments of doubt. Well, Fred Anderson did what any good pastor would do with a dying parishioner. He read from the Psalms, Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, therefore we will not fear. Psalm 121, I will lift up my eyes to the hills, from whence does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And of course, the passage from Mark's gospel, when the father of the epileptic boy cries out to Jesus, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And Fred Anderson said, the point is, sooner or later, no matter how rock solid we think our faith is, something in life is going to come along, leaving us down and out and on the run. Have you ever found yourself in a place like that? Have you ever been down and out and on the run? The tragic death of a child in a car accident, the diagnosis of terminal cancer, the unexpected financial reversal, like the stock market this week. Even the strongest believer confronts moments like these when what, was, what seemed rock solid, what has sustained us throughout our lives, suddenly evaporates. The Reverend Julian Moreno served as pastor of Primera Iglesia Bautista, First Baptist Church, in Uvalde, Texas, for 50 years. His 10-year-old great-granddaughter, Lexi, was one of the 19 children and two teachers who died in the May 24th mass shooting at Robb Elementary School. Reverend Moreno lives a block from the school. He's 80 years old, he lives a block from the school, and it was his job every day to pick Lexi up from school. That was my full-time non-paying job, he told Time Magazine, one that I enjoyed completely. But now he and his entire community find themselves down and out and on the run. There is an emptiness, he says, putting his hand on his chest, heartache, trying to process why or how it happened. Life has a way of doing that, doesn't it? Life has a way of presenting us with moments, confronting us with moments that rock our world, shake us out of all of our, certain, uh, all of our certainties, shatter our illusions, and leave us like David H.C. Reed was at that moment in his life, down and out and on the run. Such was the case with the prophet Elijah. In 1 Kings 19, this most fearless of prophets is anything but fearless. This moment in the career of Elijah fleeing into the wilderness in fear of the wrath of Queen Jezebel seems so uncharacteristic of him. Was there ever a more courageous figure in the Old Testament save Moses himself? 
Elijah was the prophet of all prophets, the prophet who stood up to King Ahab, called an end to the drought, brought the widow's son back to life, and triumphed over the 450 prophets of Baal. There on Mount Carmel, Elijah challenged them to a contest to prove just who was God, Baal or Yahweh. You remember the story from 1 Kings 18, I, or I hope you read it in preparation for this service, how altars were built for both Baal and Yahweh. Bulls were slaughtered and placed on each of the altar. The prophets of Baal spent all day pr praying and pleading, crying and flagellating themselves, begging for Baal to bring down fire on that altar. But Baal failed to show. 1 Kings 18.29 records, as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation, but there was no voice, no answer, and no response. No voice, no answer, and no response. That sums up the false gods that we are constantly tempted to place our trust in, the God of money, the God of career success, the gods of political power, corporate power, and religious power, the God of our own willfulness, that we can do whatever we want regardless of what God says, the God of our own hedonistic pleasures. Here in America, we continue to sell our souls and the lives of our children to the God of the almighty firearm. On August 4th, we will have the third anniversary of the mass shooting in Dayton's Oregon district that killed nine people and wounded dozens of others. The shooter, by the way, was my wife Libby's former teacher, as was his sister, whom he also killed. During the vigil the Sunday evening after the shooting, the crowd of, gra of grieving people who gathered at, on West 5th Street chanted at Governor Mike DeWine, do something. Do you remember that? Do something. That's what, the, that's what they were calling for. And so we might well ask, well, what has Governor DeWine d done? Now, I must tell you, I met Governor DeWine at your grandmother's service several months ago. He's a very nice man, kind of short and walks with a serious purpose, you know, like he's on, always on his way somewhere. And uh, he came up to me and I said, you look familiar. And he said, I'm Mike DeWine. And I shook his hand and I said, well, Governor, nice to meet you and thank you for your leadership on COVID. He, Governor DeWine has been one of the best governors of all the states in following the science on COVID and has kept a lot of Ohioans alive as a result. But we have to ask, what has he done in response to the cries of the people in the Oregon district and, and afterwards? Has he and the legislature banned AR-15 assault-style rifles and high-capacity magazines, required universal background checks, strengthened red flag laws so people who shouldn't have guns don't get them? Nope, none of the above. In 2021, he signed a Stand Your Ground law that will make violent confrontations perhaps more likely. In March, he signed a bill to make it easier for any adult to carry a firearm without a permit or any training whatsoever. And on Monday, he signed a bill to allow teachers to carry firearms and cut the number of hours of training required from 700 to 24. And so his solution to the threat of mass shootings in schools is more guns in schools. What could possibly go wrong? Every time there's a mass shooting, the NRA apologists and their fellow travelers trot out the same canards. Guns don't kill people, people do. But a person armed with an AR-15 can kill a hell of a lot of them. The only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. The May 14 Topps Market shooting in Buffalo disproves that premise. And if we outlaw guns, only outlaws will have them. But data from other countries shows that restrictions on gun ownership mean fewer gun deaths. Now, I'm not opposed to gun ownership. I told you this last month in my sermon on the Sixth Commandment. Um, my former church, Bellbrook Presbyterian, was like, they liked to brag they were the only church in the Presbytery with their own shooting team. 
and I enjoyed the sport of shooting with several of them. But I wonder, when will we as a people rise up and demand an end to the gun lobby's hegemony over our government and our society in its approach to gun violence? The God of the almighty firearm is just one of the many false gods that, like Baal of old, promise much but deliver only futility, destruction, and death. And so when we are down and out and on the run and turn to these false gods for help in our time of need, inevitably there is no voice and no answer and no response. Well, then comes Elijah's turn. He instructs the people to drench the altar with water, not once, but three times. Then Elijah prays and he calls on the name of the Lord and fire falls down from heaven and the sacrifice is consumed and all the water is dried up. Thereupon, Elijah instructs the people to seize the prophets of Baal, drag them to the Wadi Kishon, and there kill all 450 of them, which they did. And, and that's one of many troubling texts of violence in the Old Testament that scholars try to figure out what it means. So maybe that's a sermon for another day, but anyway. And, and so as King Ahab recounts to his queen, Queen Jezebel, what had happened, the massacre of her prophets, she wastes no time in announcing that Elijah will soon meet the same fate at her hand as did her prophets. Now, I, when I read this to you, I was wondering, why does she send a messenger? Why doesn't she just send the soldiers? If she really wants to get him, why does she just, you know, it's like you, you warn someone in advance, like if someone's going to be arrested by the FBI, do they send a, you know, send a, a messenger in advance? Uh, that part of the text I'm still wondering about. But anyway, the result is, you know, you, now we would expect that Elijah, God's boldest mouthpiece, the one Old Testament scholar Thomas Dozman called the Rambo of all prophets, we would expect that he would stand up fearlessly to Jezebel as he's done before. But what happens? Elijah's knees buckle. The Rambo of prophets has an acute failure of nerve. I don't know if any of you remember the Rambo movies, but I watched one of them not too long ago. John Rambo was a tough dude, but he was also a very troubled guy. So anyway, Elijah, filled with fear and foreboding, goes on the run. He heads south to Beersheba, Beersheba, to the southern edge of Judah, leaving his servant behind. He goes a full day's journey into the southern wilderness. There he finds a broom tree, a shrub, with enough protection from the hot desert sun to shelter him as he lies down to die. So let that sink in for a moment. Here is the man who will ultimately be carried off to heaven in a chariot of fire, God's champion of champions running in fear to the point of exhaustion, collapsing under a shrub in complete and utter defeat. And in his delirium of fatigue, we can hear Elijah saying, It is enough, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. It makes our moments of fear and doubt seem infantile, Yes, except when we find ourselves actually caught tightly in their grip. That is when our doubts are most real and our fears are the most powerful thing in the world. It is not unlike depression. Have any of you had times in your life when you struggled with depression? I'm guessing that most of us have. And sometimes you can fall so deep into depression that you cannot envision any alternative reality. You find it impossible to believe that anything can help, that things will ever get better. And that is precisely where Elijah is, slumbering at the edge of the valley of the shadow of death, and suddenly he is awakened by a messenger. That's what an angel is, of course, a divine messenger. And the angel points to a cake baking on hot stones and a jar of water next to it and commands Elijah, get up and eat. And Elijah does. But no sooner has he eaten and then washed it down with the last swallow of the water than he falls back, back asleep. Once more, the angel appears with the same command. 
get up and eat. And now there's a new twist. Otherwise, the journey will be too much for you. Journey, you mean there's more? Yes, there is. Note that it is in the wilderness when Elijah thinks that he is at the lowest moment of his life that God's messenger appears first with reassurance, first with sustenance, and then with reassurance, and then with the word that God has more in store for him and for us, and for us. You see, Elijah was no more the master of his own faith than we are. And often it is only when we reach the end of our veritable rope, when we find ourselves in the wilderness of defeat and despair, that we are finally able to hear an encouraging, life-sustaining word from the Lord. Well, what happens? Elijah does what he is told. He obeys the angel's instructions. He eats the food that is provided. It must have been some kind of high protein, calorie loaded meal, you know, like high energy bars or I don't know, things marathoners might eat before a marathon. But we are told he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. And again, we see the significance of the biblical number 40, 40 years. Moses spent 40 days on Mount Sinai. Israel spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Later, Jesus will spend 40 days in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. And here, Elijah travels 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb. What some Old Testament texts called Horeb, especially in the book of Deuteronomy, others call Sinai. Mount Sinai is where Moses first encountered the Lord at the burning bush and later where he received the Ten Commandments. This is the place where God reveals God's self, where God makes covenant with the people and hands down laws and instructions. Elijah climbs up to the top of Horeb and hunkers down in a cave. Although no longer at the point of death, he is still down and out and in hiding, but there's no hiding from the God of Israel. In the apparent safety of that cave, the word of the Lord comes to him. Elijah, what are you doing here? It is less a question than a judgment, and Elijah knows it. And notice that his response is both defensive and self-pitying. I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I, I alone, am left and they are seeking my life to take it away. Now we might call this Elijah's prophetic pout. I, I alone am left, he says. Sound familiar? Have you had moments of hardship when you were convinced that you were the only one to bear such trouble, that nobody else was facing what you had to face? The truth of the matter is that sometimes we like the darkness of the cave. Sometimes, we want to surrender ourselves to our own version of Elijah's prophetic pout and feel sorry for ourselves. But God won't stand for it. Go, says God, get out of this cave and stand before me. I'm about to pass by. And so Elijah moves to the mouth of the cave. And as he does, all of the physical manifestations of God's presence suddenly appear. There's the, the mighty wind that crushes the rocks. There's the earthquake that makes the earth tremble. There's the fire that rages out of control. Each of these a classic response of creation to the glory and presence of Almighty God. But God is not found in any of them. Finally, after repeating the whole conversation that they already had, you know, what are you doing, Elijah? And I'm the only one left, and so on and so forth. Finally, Elijah feels a gentle breeze, and then there comes the sound of sheer silence. The phrase in verse 12 that reads in the NRSV, the sound of sheer silence, has been translated in various ways. In the King James Version, it is a still small voice. In the Living Bible, it is the sound of a gentle whisper. In the Common English Bible, there was a sound, thin, quiet. In the message, a gentle and quiet whisper. The point here is that God speaks, but not in all the usual ways. 
not in the wind or the earthquake or the fire, but in a gentle, quiet whisper. The, you have to quiet your heart. You have to calm your soul in order to hear such a sound. The stage is now set, and Elijah knows it. The God he serves, who has spoken to kings, queens, false prophets, and God's people through him, is about to speak again. Wrapping his face in his mantle, Elijah stands at the mouth of the cave, and instead of now complaining, he listens. And as he does, he rediscovers the God who has called him, who has nurtured him, who has worked and spoken through him, and now that same God sends him back into the world to take actions that will change the course of history for God's people. Elijah now realizes that he is not alone, as he had thought, nor is he God's only faithful servant left, for God says there are yet 7,000 others who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Sometimes, friends, in our most difficult and depressed moments, we discover, like Elijah, that God is at work for purposes that we may not yet understand. Yet it means bearing the darkness and the silence and the doubt, confident that against all signs to the contrary, God is walking with us through the dark valley, and God will not give up on us even when we feel like giving up on God. This is what faith means, my friends, hoping against hope that God is there and that God will not abandon you. And so in the midst of unspeakable sorrow, Pastor Julian Moreno has found comfort and strength in his faith. Every fiber of my human emotions in my mind cries out to hate, to be angry, he says, from a pew of the church where he preached for 50 years. And then I remember that I have preached a number of times the words of Jesus. He said that we must learn to love our enemies. This experience has taught me to live those words. He also counsels his grieving granddaughter and her husband that they too will learn from this agony so that someday they and other grieving parents may be able to guide others through life's darkest moments. I tell them, he says, that one of these days in the future, you may be having a friend or a couple come to you after having lost a loved one, and you're going to be able to share not something you read in a book, not something that you got from a counseling course. You're going to be, be sharing your pain and how you survived. The promise of our faith is that no matter where we are in life, no matter how tragic our circumstances may be, God will never leave us or forsake us. God promises to provide strength and the courage we need to endure and to overcome and to help others who face trials and tragedies themselves. The poet Annie Johnson Flint, who experienced great suffering in her life, said it best, God has not promised skies ever blue, flower-strewn pathways all our lives through, God has not promised skies without rain, joy without sorrow, peace without pain, but God has promised strength for the day, rest for the labor, light for the way, grace for the trials, help from above, unfailing sympathy, undying love. And so as Fred Anderson listened to his predecessor, David Reed's expressions of fear and doubt, he thought back to a former church and a parishioner named Harry, who had been a bricklayer all his life. He was a short man, strong and wiry, and he'd been a member of that church and a member of the men's Bible class for 50 years. Harry's diabetes had finally gotten the best of him, and now he was in the hospital and about to have both legs amputated. And when Pastor Anderson visited him before the surgery to pray with him, he said, Harry, are you afraid? And Harry said, no, I've trusted the Lord all these years. Now is no time to stop. And so Fred Anderson was able to say to David H.C. Reed, one of the greatest preachers of the 20th century, David, you've trusted in the Lord all these years. 
Now is no time to stop. Hoping against hope is what it means to trust in the Lord, especially when you are down and out and on the run. May it be so in your life and in mine. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us affirm our faith by joining in a portion of the brief statement of faith. Let us say what we believe. We trust in God whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people to live as one community. But we rebel against God we hide from our Creator. Ignoring God's commandments, we violate the image of God in others and ourselves, accept lies as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation, yet God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. I was thinking how blessed we are as a church. We have so many committed and gifted people. And uh, yesterday, one of our committed and gifted leaders was called into action to get a plumber in here, David Miller, because there was a leak over in this corner of the building. Uh, this bath, there's a bathroom up here, in case you don't know. 
and it was leaking. The plumber couldn't find the source of the leak, but it meant that all the water was off in the building. So we canceled coffee hour. I guess we're still canceling coffee hour today. We'll make up for it next Sunday. But there still seems to be water leaking over here. So we pray for the trustees that they'll find, find that the plumber, and they and the plumber can find the source of the problem. But anyway, it got me thinking how blessed we are and how generous you are. And so let's dedicate the offering by singing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Please be seated. And for Father's Day, we, similar to what we did on Mother's Day, we have a litany for Father's Day that I invite you to turn to now, and you will respond when I say, Lord, in your mercy, you'll respond, hear our prayer, and there'll be a moment of silence for your petitions. So let us join now in this litany of prayer for Father's Day. On this day, we remember fathers everywhere. Let us offer our prayers to God, our Heavenly Father, who has adopted us as sons and daughters through the waters of baptism. Let us pray. O God, you formed your son Adam from the dust of the ground and breathed your holy breath into his lungs, giving us all the gift of life. Breathe again your life into us, your children and your church that we might be one with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of all, you formed great nations out of great families and blessed the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that they might be a blessing to all. Bless our nation and all the nations of the world with your fatherly presence, wisdom, and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As the children of Israel found themselves slaves making bricks for Pharaoh, before you heard their cry and brought them to freedom, we pray for all in this world who are in trouble of any kind. We pray for the poor, the hungry, the imprisoned, for refugees, the victims of war, and all who live in terror's wake including the people of Ukraine and other communities suffering from senseless violence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your son Jesus was raised by Joseph the carpenter, who saw him grow year by year in strength and wisdom. We pray for all the fathers in our family of faith, and especially those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this month. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your son, Jesus, neither married nor raised children of his own, but he helped countless members of your numbers of your children come and mature to fullness of life and to life everlasting. And so we pray for all who nurture others with love and patience as spiritual parents. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jacob's son, Joseph, to whom he gave the radiant coat, was beaten, betrayed, and sold into a life of hardship before rising to greatness. And so we pray for all who are injured, hurt, sick, lonely, or live in fear, especially those who we name before you this morning. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless expectant fathers 
who await the birth of their child with joy, and those who did not expect or want to be fathers. Bless those who embrace fatherhood through adoption or foster parenting, remarriage, or single parenthood, and those who are still waiting and hoping to become fathers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, be with fathers whose work takes them away from their children, and bless teachers, coaches, and mentors who serve as father figures for others. Bless all children whose fathers were loving and all whose fathers failed to meet their needs for love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, as our Heavenly Father, you gave us the gift of your own Son, and out of our human blindness the crowds called for him to die on a cross. We pray for the dying and the dead, that you might bring all your children home. Bless fathers who have lost a child, and families who have lost a father, and bless wise grandfathers, loving uncles, and caring godfathers who give love and support in their absence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our Father who dwells in heaven, strengthen and bless all fathers to be faithful, loving, and present. And for those fathers who you have brought into your kingdom ahead of your, their children and grandchildren, their children and children ahead of their fathers, enfold them with your holy light and enfold us with your comfort now and forever. Abba, we pray. Amen. And now let us pray boldly as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 404, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. and of the Holy Spirit, one God, and God's people said, Amen. Amen.